If you'll take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Luke, <clears throat> Luke chapter 7, where we find ourselves this morning. We've walked very carefully through the book of Luke so far, chapters 1 through 6. We've seen the great care that Luke has given to declare to us the message of Christ. He's been very careful to give us one piece at a time and to drill each piece of the gospel of Jesus Christ miles deep into our hearts before moving on to the next one. He, remember that Luke is writing the book of this book, this book of Luke, to a man named Theophilus who was uncertain of the truth of the things he'd heard about Jesus. He may have been a believer or maybe he was um, on the fence about whether Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is God, all of those things. But at any rate, he wanted to know what was the truth about what really happened. So Luke writes to him, explaining that he's thoroughly researched these things, and here's the things he's determined are definitely true. And he's included <clears throat> specifically those things that declare very carefully the message of Christ to Theophilus. So that Theophilus, by the end of reading this book, understands what Jesus' message was, what he did to prove his message, and the fact that all of this is certainly true. Um, so we've seen so far in Luke chapters 1 and 2, the introduction, we see the backstory, we see the, the birth of John the Baptist and the birth of, of Jesus in Luke chapters 1 and 2, and then a little bit about the life, the, uh, the early life of Jesus in the end of chapter 2. And chapter 3 John the Baptist came on the scene, and Luke jumps forward 30 years to when John the Baptist is uh, preaching, and his message was, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, repent. And this message was, um, was, the, mes was the theme that Luke chose to use for the remainder of the chapters that we've studied, from chapter 3 to chapter 4 to chapter 5, even chapter 6, we've seen over and over again this one theme, repent. Uh, John the Baptist said, listen, it's not good enough to come and get baptized and pretend like you're a repentant person. Show that you're repentant. Actually be repentant. To, like Choose to recognize your sin and attempt to live in a different way if you're really repentant. Because repentance is a thing that takes place on the inside. It's a heart attitude of disgust towards oneself. It's recognizing that I'm wrong and that uh, Christ is right, and I must turn to him for salvation. So in chapter 4, Jesus comes on the scene, and Luke jumps forward about eight months in the story, in the storyline, in the chronology, and gives us Jesus showing, at, showing up in Nazareth and preaching, I'm here to save your wicked sinful souls. I'm summarizing, but he's quoting from the book of Isaiah, saying you are all poor and, and captives and broken and I'm here to save you from that. In a spiritual sense, you are all destitute. And of course, they wanted to kill him for that. How dare he say that they were sinners? They were repentant. They wouldn't admit that they were sinners. In chapter 5, Jesus comes and he, he meets Peter. And he, when Peter realizes who Jesus is, he falls at his feet and says, Depart from me, for I am a sinner. In chapter 5 also, he he goes and a man is lowered to him from the roof. And, and uh, seeing the faith of this man and his friends, Jesus claims that he has forgiven the man's sins. And then to prove that he actually does have the power to forgive sins, he raises the man who is uh, paralyzed from his bed and sends him on his way to prove that he truly does have power to forgive sins. At this, the Pharisees and the religious teachers of the day were very upset. How can anyone forgive sins but God himself? Jesus is blaspheming, claiming that he's God. But yet, they couldn't deny the fact that Jesus had raised a person from the dead. How could he raise a person from the dead if he's claiming to be God and isn't? Wouldn't God step in and stop him from raising people from the dead if he's claiming to be God falsely? Well, of course he would. So how can we explain this? There's no explanation. So instead, they tried to accuse him of breaking their pharisaical uh, laws that they've added to the Old Testament. And, and Jesus 
responded to the Pharisees in the end of chapter 5 and the beginning of chapter 6 saying, in fact, not only am I not a sinner for breaking your additions to the Old Testament, but also, by the way, you are sinners and you need to repent as well. And that was all the theme through chapter 4 and 5 and 6. Even in the Sermon on the Mount, it was, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who recognize that they are truly destitute in their spirit, those who are recognize their sin, who are repentant over it, those are the ones who are blessed. Everyone else is in serious trouble. Because everyone's a sinner, but only the ones who see it and run from it to Jesus Christ as Savior can find rescue from the terrible wrath of God that is coming on them for their sin. This has been the theme. So far, we've seen repentance, 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 sin, sin, sin. Now, Luke is going to introduce to us a brand new concept for the book of Luke, and that is the word faith. Read with me if you would. Luke chapter 7, verse 1. Now when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum, and a certain centurion's servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation and hath built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers, and I say unto one, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. And when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned him about, and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. <laughs> this is spectacular. What a spectacular few verses we've just read. And, and I hope to show you the spectacular nature of these verses. These uh, We've seen already in the book of Luke that Luke really likes to to draw out and emphasize ironic things that happen, things that are opposite of what you would expect. Just, just, just there's no way that you would, if you were writing this, that you would, you would expect this to happen this way. You would never, you'd never write a lie this way. The, only, you couldn't make this stuff up is what, is what I'm saying. It's so ironic. It's so crazy what happens here. And, and I hope to show you this. I think after reading this, Theophilus must have gone back and said, wait, hold on a second. I've got to read that again. Let, let, am I reading this right? And the most obvious thing to us is that Jesus was amazed at a person's faith. He marvels over the faith. And we'll talk about that, I'm sure, as we get further into the passage. Clearly, Jesus wasn't surprised by the faith, as if he didn't know that it was coming. Oh, I'm shocked. But he's marveling at it. He's talking about its wonder. It's sort of like when you climb a mountain and, and behold the view, even if you've climbed that mountain before. It's not surprising to you. It's just marvelous. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's marveling at the faith of this individual. This is a marvelous thing. And so I, I have taken the term that we're so familiar with, amazing grace, and just called this sermon amazing faith. And I, I like to use that for the passage. But Jesus is amazed at this man's faith. Now, this is the first time that in Jesus' message we're seeing this concept of faith coming up in the book of Luke. Not that he hadn't spoken about it before. Certainly, he had spoken about it before. If you read the book of Matthew, it's, it's mentioned a little bit in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, the concept of faith. But, um, but now Luke is drawing it out. He's, he's given us repentance. He's given us sin. And now he wants to show us faith. And I think we'll see why in just a moment, so bear with me on that. Let's first walk through this passage verse by verse and let it, let, it, let it be revealed to us as we understand what's happening here. 
And I think you'll see the irony as we go. Verse 1, Now, when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people. Remember, what were the sayings? Well, this was the Sermon on the Mount that we just read in Luke chapter 6. Jesus was on the mountain. He had gone up there. He, there was crowds of people. He had left and gone up all night long. He was in the mountain praying. Then he called all of his disciples, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of a hundred or so of them, up to the top of the mountain. Now we, we guess that there's going to be at least a hundred because later he sends 72 of them out, two by two, to go uh, bring the same message that he's preaching to other places. So there has to be more than 70 of them, so I'm just going to guess 100. That's a good, nice round number. But there's a good number of disciples that he calls up to the top of the mountain, and out of his many disciples, he chooses 12 that are going to be his apostles. They're his 12 disciples and his 12 apostles. And then he comes down, at least some way down the mountain, maybe halfway or all the way, and down at the bottom there's a plain or something like that. But he comes down at least a little way down the mountain, and there's a large crowd of people that have gathered there. And he begins to heal their sicknesses and their diseases. He's doing these miracles. He stops at some point, and he turns to the disciples, and he begins to speak, and he preaches to them the Sermon on the Mount in the audience of all the other people. That's why it says... Now, he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people. He wasn't talking to the people. He was talking to his disciples, that uh, smaller crowd of disciples, but in the audience of the larger crowd of people who were there just to get their healing or, or to hear him as, um, as something to do. The disciples were the ones who were following him. They were, they were uh, learners. That's what the word means. They were following him, trying to learn the teachings you know, from one place to another, that sort of a thing. And now he's chosen 12 of them to be his apostles, his representatives. So, when he's ended all of this, he walks down whatever way is left down the mountain and goes into Capernaum, it says in verse 1. Now, this is important because both Matthew and Luke connect these two events. They show that uh, Matthew has only one event that he, that he records in between the Sermon on the Mount and the healing of the centurion's servant. And it just... It's very obvious that these did happen on that same day. Jesus has been up all night the night before. He's chosen his 12 apostles. He's delivered the Sermon on the Mount. Now it's still the same day. It's probably getting late in the day. He's coming into Capernaum. The man must be very tired. Um, and it says, verse 2, a certain centurion's servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. All of a sudden, you know, if you're Theophilus, you're saying, Hang on a minute. A centurion's servant who was dear unto him. That's a little odd. Because a, because a servant in these times was not anything special. Right? It was it was very rare that he was dear to a centurion. A centurion would have servants. Some of them would even be like um, protégés, children that would be um, you know, apprentices being trained to be centurions. But that centurion legally had the right to treat that servant any way that he wanted. Literally, any way that he wanted. Legally, in the Roman Empire, he could beat the servant, he could kill the servant, he could do whatever he wanted. There was no repercussions. It was just a servant. Uh, there was Greek philosophers who wrote about how, you know, a servant's no different than a, than a, a camel or any tool that's in your shed. It's just uh, something to get a, to get a work to get a job done, and you do with your servant as you would with a tool or any, anything else that you need to, to accomplish a task. Uh, this was how they looked at servants. So for a centurion to have a servant who is dear unto him makes, gives you pause already. This is a little bit of an odd story that this centurion would have a servant dear unto him. Now a centurion is a Roman soldier, uh, and he is in charge of about a hundred men. Centurions would be in charge of up to about a hundred men, and that's where actually where we get the word century from today, from the uh, word centurion, because a century is a hundred years, and they had uh, about a hundred men. He would have been here in Capernaum to keep the peace. He's making sure that the people in Capernaum continue to follow the laws of the Roman Empire while they're doing all their Jewish stuff. You do whatever you want, just make sure you don't you don't break the laws of the Roman Empire. We're here to make sure you don't go against Rome and we keep the peace. 
And so he had a hundred men under him. He's probably the highest Roman officer in Capernaum. Capernaum wasn't a very large um, city. It was more of a town. And so a hundred men is probably more than enough to keep the people in Capernaum in line. So he's the guy in charge of Capernaum, apparently. And so the centurion over Capernaum um, has, a, has a servant who's dear to him. But the servant is sick and ready to die. They, they can tell this, he's not long for this world. So verse 3, when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. Now, let's talk about that first phrase, when he heard of Jesus. What did he hear about Jesus? Well, we don't know this for certain, but it's very likely that he heard the story that we have recorded for us in John chapter 4. Because this, this account in John chapter 4 took place probably six months to a year before the one we're reading in Luke chapter 7. Now, look at the similarities between these two accounts. Look at what it says in John chapter 4, verse 46. So Jesus came into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Here's a nobleman, meaning he's a Jewish man who's who's a nobleman. He's rich, probably has lots of influence, maybe even political influence. He's a nobleman, and his son is sick at Capernaum. That's the same town, isn't it? It's not the same guy. He's a nobleman. He's a Jewish man, and it's his son. It's not a servant, but he's in Capernaum. And this is happening, again, about six months to a year before the account we just read. Verse 47, when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So this nobleman goes to Jesus and begs him to come to his house to heal his son. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The nobleman says, you Come and heal my son. And Jesus says, Well, unless I come to your house and heal your son, you won't believe that I can heal your son. Um, verse 49, the nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. Verse 50, Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. He said, because he believed and went his way, uh, is the implication that now his, servant, his son is going to be healed. Verse 51, and as he was now going, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of the hour of, of them, the hour when he began to amend, and they saith unto him, they said unto him, Yesterday is the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed at his whole house. This is again the second miracle which Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. So this is one of the first miracles Jesus did in Capernaum was he healed this nobleman's son and instructed the nobleman on having faith. And the idea of the faith was, I don't need to come to your house. I can just say it if you believe it, and it can happen. It doesn't even have, you don't even have to believe it. But in this case, Jesus was requiring his faith. Um, and so this was probably, now you could, you could see why it's a really good guess, that when we read about the centurion who heard of Jesus, this is probably what he heard. He probably heard many things about Jesus, but certainly he would have heard of a nobleman. I mean, the centurion over, Cain, uh, over Capernaum would certainly know this nobleman, wouldn't he? I mean, he's a nobleman in, Ca in Capernaum. There can't be that many of them. It's, it's Capernaum, right? And, uh, and the centurion is in charge of the town. He probably knows the nobleman. He certainly must have heard of this spectacular event. And you can tell by the way that he's acting that he's responding to the way Jesus treated the nobleman. The, Jesus treated the nobleman saying, I don't need to go to your house to heal the servant. Now the centurion is going to say to Jesus, don't bother coming to my house. You don't need to come. Just heal my servant. It was the nobleman, it was his son. For the centurion, it's his, his servant. So you can see that there's, there's no direct statement in the scriptures that tell us that this is what he knew. But I think that's a pretty good guess. Anyway, this, it says in verse 3, when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews. Now, hang on a minute. The elders of the Jews? Okay, so we have a centurion who loves his servant. That's a little odd. Centurions don't usually care about their servants. Now we have a centurion 
who cares about a servant and can send the elders of the Jews to do whatever he wants. Remember, the Romans are the occupying force in Israel. The elders of the Jews don't like the Romans. They don't. The, the Romans are the bad guys. Okay? You know what the elders of the Jews also don't like? They're not too fond of Jesus. <laughs> they don't really like the fact... Uh, when you hear elders of the Jews, you're, you're, you're seeing a group, lots of different people are going to be part of that. This is probably the Sanhedrin Council in Capernaum. There would be a Sanhedrin Council that would be your, ju your judiciary bench in any large enough town in Israel. And then, of course, the great Sanhedrin was in, it was in Jerusalem. But in every town that's large enough to have one, you'd have a Sanhedrin Council. And on that Sanhedrin Council were probably some Sadducees and almost certainly many Pharisees. And so here's the elders of the Jews, probably those who make up the council, certainly some Pharisees, the ones who've just been sparring with Jesus uh, in previous passages. Uh, remember, we're about a year and a half into the ministry of Christ by this point, and so there's this friction that's building between the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Jewish leaders and Jesus. But yet here in the middle of all of that, here comes Jewish leaders to Jesus, begging Jesus to heal a Roman's servant. None of this makes sense. All of it is the exact opposite of what you would expect, right? And that's what Luke is trying to show. He's trying to show the irony of this situation to get your attention. And we often miss it because we don't understand the culture. At this point, Theophilus is reading Luke chapter 7. It didn't have chapters back then when he got it, but that's okay. He's reading this passage, and he's saying to himself, something weird is happening, I better pay attention. And I think that's the point. We're being drawn to the importance of this passage because of its incredible irony. Verse 3. So, here's a centurion who cares dearly for his servant. He sends the elders of the Jews to Jesus, and it says in verse 3, they came beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when, verse 4, they came to Jesus... They besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. Now, understand, the perspective of the Jewish leaders is you are righteous or worthy because of the things you do. Your actions produce righteousness. You are a righteous person based on whether or not you've done good things based on their standards and you are unrighteous based on whether you've done bad things based on their standards. It's not, about the, it's not about the standards of the Lord or the standards really even of the Old Testament, though they certainly would pretend to care a lot about the Old Testament. As long as we don't get into things like trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean unto Him, lean not on your own understanding, or passages like uh, love the Lord with all your heart and soul and mind, those types of things they couldn't measure or enforce, so they didn't care about those. They cared about the, about the rules that they could enforce and add to uh, so, at any rate, they are very superficial. They're very self-righteous people. And so they come to Jesus asking him for a superficial thing. They think Jesus needs to be convinced to help this Roman guy out. Jesus isn't going to go help out a Roman um, because, you know, he's, he, you know he, then, then he'd look really bad to all the crowds and the masses if he was helping out a Roman. So we've got to convince him that this Roman is worthy of this healing for his servant. So they say, he's worthy for whom he should do this, for he loveth our nation and hath built us a synagogue. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. The synagogue that Jesus preached in, in Capernaum, was probably built by this man. The assumption is that it was the synagogue in Capernaum that, that he had built. So, I mean, that's incredible. This Roman centurion who is in charge of keeping the peace... And knowing that the people there hated him, still went and built them a synagogue. Do you see here that Jesus has, has certainly is aware that this has all been orchestrated and planned? I mean, Jesus is God, right? And God has orchestrated and planned all of this. Because this is, this is the example of the Sermon on the Mount he just preached. What? Love your enemies? Here's a centurion loving his enemies. And the Jews love him because of what he's done. They wouldn't love him if he was still their enemy, but they love him because he's become their friend. While he loved them, while they were still his enemies. You see, the example here is that one person is following the Sermon on the Mount, and he's the Roman guy. 
And the Jewish leaders are not following the Sermon on the Mount. They think he's worthy because of what he's done, not just because he's a person made in the image of God, those sort of things. Okay, so that's, that's, here's, that's the introduction. This is what's happening. We're, we're, we're bringing this whole pot to a boil now. Let's, let's see what happens. He was worthy for whom they should do it, they said, for he loveth our nation, verse 5, and hath built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them. So the impression of the Jews, he's such a worthy man, he's such a good guy, you, he's, he's totally worthy of this. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. So as they're coming, apparently there were friends of, of the centurion who were you know, in this crowd of people that ran ahead. I'm sure Jesus wasn't making good time. You know, it wasn't like he was you know, getting 70 miles an hour down the highway with all these crowds of people, right? I mean, he's walking there. And so people run ahead, apparently, and tell the centurion, he's on his way, he's on his way. And the centurion is thinking, no, 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 I didn't want him to have to come I didn't want him to force him to come to heal my servant. Um, he says, I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. So he says, go back and tell Jesus, don't bother coming. He says, don't trouble thyself. That word trouble is, is, is a word in Greek that just means an annoyance. He's like, don't let me be an annoyance to you. Don't let me distract you from the things you're doing. What, what this man is not just saying, I'm, I'm not worthy. He's saying, my purposes and my goals and the things that, that concern me, the most important thing that, I can, that possibly concerns me, healing this servant that I care for dear, dearly, is secondary to what you're doing. Your will, your plan is primary. Mine is just an annoyance. Just If you could just say a word and be, let it be as little annoyance as possible and then go about the things that you're doing... Because what you're doing is more important than what I want. Wow. That is the attitude of someone who is repentant. You see, this is the example of repentance. This is the repentant man. He, he's, he's only heard of Jesus. He, as far as we know, he's never actually heard Jesus speak. He's just heard of Jesus, and he's already repentant. Look, I'm not worthy what your your will is better than mine. I, I deny myself. I'm I, I I'm I'm low. I'm poor in spirit. I'm I, I weep over my own lack of righteousness. I I recognize all of that. Look at where he he stands. This centurion is the example of a repentant man. Why is he repentant? Well, we've already given it away, but we'll find the answer. Of course, is his faith. But let's continue on. He says, Lord, trouble not thyself. Don't let me be an annoyance to you, for I am not worthy. He says, these, these Jewish leaders, don't listen to them. They, they, they told you that I'm worthy. I'm not. I am not worthy. I, you, are, you are the great, holy, perfect God. I am the lowly sinner. I'm not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. you got to think he's heard the story of this man in John chapter 4, right? He says, look, I didn't even think that I was worthy to come to you. There was a noble man who came to you, and you sent him away, and it wasn't until he went away that you healed his servant. And, and he was a noble man of the Jews. So, listen, if he's not worthy, I'm certainly not worthy to come to you. Uh, I'm just I'm just a Roman guy, and and you might think that this was oh I'm not worthy because because I know the Jewish law and the the Judaiz, the Judaizers have have added these rules about how you can't go into a house that's a that's a that's a a, a Gentile's house because it'll defile you and all that kind of stuff. But certainly the r r leaders of the Jews didn't mind going to his house. Like they they wouldn't go to any any other Gentile's house, but they apparently had no problem with him. So it wasn't so much about, oh, you're going to offend the, the leaders of the Jews coming in here. because No, it was, I'm just not worthy. I, I recognize my unworthiness. There is, this reminds us of Peter, who, who when he realized who Jesus was, fell on his knees before him and said, I'm a sinner. 
But it's, it's greater than that. It's so much greater than that that Jesus said, there, I didn't, couldn't find faith like this anywhere in Israel. Even Peter didn't have faith like his. Look at what it says. For I also, in verse 8, I also am a man set under authority. He says, look, I'm just another guy who has someone over me. I mean, yeah, sure, I'm over a hundred guys. But there's a hundred guys over me, you know, that I have to answer to as well. I'm just another, I'm just another cog in, in the, in the wheel, you know. Is that, is that the right illustrate? Cog in a wheel? Whatever. I'm just another guy in the whole Roman Empire. I'm, I have to follow the things that I'm told. And just like the people under me follow the things that they're told, I'm nothing special. It doesn't make me special just because I'm over a hundred people. It says, look, I'm set under authority. He's contrasting himself with Jesus. He says, I'm not worthy for you to come into my house because I am under authority and you are not. There's no authority greater than yours. There's no authority over you. I still have to answer to somebody. You don't. You don't have to answer to anybody. You are the greatest authority that exists. It, he's, he's saying, like, if the Caesar was going to come to my house, I'd say, don't bother, because I'm a nobody. But you're higher than the Caesar, <laughs> okay? You are, you are the only person who has no authority above you. Don't bother coming to my house. I'm just another, another guy who has to answer to higher ups. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers, and I say to one, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh. He says, what do I do? I tell one person to go do something, and he does it. Does that make me special? Does that... That doesn't make me worthy of you coming into my house. I told somebody to go build a synagogue for, for the Jews. Does that make me worthy of you coming into my house? Absolutely not. Look, even his good deeds, he does not see them as making him worthy of the favor of God. He says, my good deeds, those don't earn me favor with you. You are the ultimate authority. I am a little bit of nothing. I am unworthy. So he says... Um, Verse, uh, he, he says that he, this is the reason why he would not come in, in person to speak with Jesus because how dare he? Like, who is he to come and speak to Jesus as if he's something important? He just sent the, the Jewish leaders and said, let them do it. Let them ask him. I'm not important. Um, so verse 9, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. So he paused and took time to appreciate the beauty of what had just happened. I, I, do, I do imagine it like getting to the top of a mountain and just taking time to appreciate the beauty of the scenery you're looking at. Jesus says, boy, that's beautiful. He just stops, everything stops. He stops walking. He says, he says he turns around. He said, turned him about and the people that followed him, unto the people that followed him, and said, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith no, not in Israel. <laughs> oh, that's pretty offensive. Here's the Jewish leaders, and Jesus is saying, his faith is greater than yours. Now, where did the word faith come from? Right? This is humility. This is repentance. This is lowliness. This is all of those things. Where did the word faith come from? Jesus hasn't really been speaking about faith. At least it hasn't been recorded that way in the book of Luke, because Luke has been trying to carefully explain the gospel to us. He's given us the fact that we're sinners, the fact that we're unworthy, the fact that we need to recognize this and repent and, and turn truly in our hearts toward to Christ for salvation. Now he's giving us a new element in the words of Christ. He's giving us this word faith. But everything else is already there. In this man, what this man is showing is his repentance. He's showing his recognition of his own sin. But Jesus is seeing in that his faith. Why? Because that doesn't happen unless you have true faith. That's where repentance comes from. Repentance is not the goal. If we make repentance the goal, then we say, oh, you've got to climb this mountain in order to be a Christian. And show to me that you're, you know, that you're really repentant by never sinning again, or you've got to do all these works and and that's what ends up happening for people who make an emphasis only on repentance. That's not to say repentance isn't required for salvation, but repentance is something that takes place in our hearts. And we don't really see anything on the outside except the natural results of deciding I want to live for Christ and I don't want to live for me anymore. But 
you know, then you go and mess up because you keep on making mistakes because you're still a sinful human being. And people say, well, you can't be repentant on the inside. Well, I don't know. Maybe you are. Maybe you aren't. But here is the real thing that produces the repentance. Luke is diving deeper behind repentance. He's going even, even deeper now, and he's showing us that repentance is the product. It's not the goal. The product is repentance. The goal is faith. Faith is where repentance comes from. And true faith always produces repentance. Always. If someone says, I'm a pretty good person, they do not believe what the Bible says about the God they claim they believe in. Because God declares throughout the Scriptures, constantly and irrefutably, you are sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God is only the easiest way, the easiest verse that we can remember to say it. It is on practically every verse in every page of the Bible. You are sinners and need salvation. No, there's no one who's not a sinner. No, not one. Oh, if you thought it was you, no, it's not you. You're all sinners. You have come short of the glory of God. You are desperate and depraved. And unless you have salvation, you will suffer the wrath of God. That's why the Bible was written. If you didn't need the Bible, if you didn't need Christ because you're so good, then there was no reason for him to come and die. There's no reason to write the Bible to you. You're just going to heaven anyway because you're a pretty good person. The Bible is written because we're not good people, because we are sinners. That is clear. So someone who says, I believe in God, and then with the, in the same breath, I'm a pretty good person. That's why he's going to let me into heaven you know they don't believe in the God of the Bible because that's not what the Bible declares to us. The Bible declares the exact opposite, that our goodness, like the centurion recognized, doesn't actually give us anything. In Isaiah chapter 1, it says that, um, it may not be chapter 1, I'm trying to remember which chapter, but Isaiah says, look, our righteousness is just like filthy rags. You know, the best that we have to offer God is righteousness covered in all of our sin, and it's like a filthy rag. You still can't use it for anything. You don't, wouldn't want to use it even if, you, even if you needed it because it's filthy. It's a filthy rag. Our righteousness does not somehow make up for our unrighteousness. Our righteousness is what we should be doing anyway. It's the fact that we have any unrighteousness for which we must answer to God. We don't get some special credit for the times that we've done right. All of our lives are supposed to be lived in righteousness. So you're just meeting the standard. If there's any moment in your life that is righteous, you've just met the standard. Good job. That doesn't make up for all the rest of your life that you've lived in unrighteousness. That doesn't make up for that. That's just what's required. Because you're a human being made in the image of God, made to represent God. You were made for righteousness. Your righteousness doesn't make up for the unrighteousness. Your righteousness just does what God has already said to do. It, it gives you no credit. So we need credit added to our account. That's why Christ came, suffered for our sin, lived the perfectly righteous life, and offers his record in exchange for ours. We can have his record as if we had never sinned, in exchange for ours. That's what we believe when we believe the gospel. A person who believes the gospel recognizes their sin and comes to repentance. That's why we say, in order to be a Christian, you must have faith and repentance. What we mean by that is you must have true faith. We don't mean that there's like multiple things that are required for salvation. Salvation is by grace, by God's grace, through faith. But not just saying, I believe. It must be true faith. And true faith produces a recognition in your heart that you are sinners. Uh, that, that I am a sinner. We, that's what true faith does. And if true faith, if you say you have true faith, but in your heart you think of yourself as a good person and not a sinner and fallen short of the glory of God, then you don't understand the gospel, let alone believe it. Because that's what the gospel proclaims. And when someone says, we're sinners and need salvation, and it makes you upset because, you know, hey, I don't, I'm not a sinner. I don't need salvation. It proves to you that you are not a true believer. Because there's a direct correlation between faith 
and humility, between faith and repentance, between faith and recognizing our own lowliness. Now, this is interesting because Jesus said that his faith was so great that he had not found so great a faith anywhere in the nation of Israel. Peter's faith was not as great as this man's faith. Peter's faith was, was a saving faith. Peter's a saved individual. He's a believer in Christ, truly. But there was a greater faith in this man than even in Peter. Guess what? There's a greater faith in this man than there was in Mary. Sorry about that, Catholics. <laughs> no one in Israel had as much faith as this man had. Why? Jesus has not... Jesus, it doesn't declare to us Jesus saw supernaturally and uh, saw his faith, although he certainly knows all things and, and could have done that if he wanted to. He's God. But Jesus is simply responding to his actions and saying that his great humbleness, his great recognition of his own sin, his great lowliness proves that he has great faith. The greater your view of yourself, the lesser your faith. The greater your faith in the God of the Bible, the lower you'll see yourself. You wonder if you're growing in faith. Am I a greater Christian today than I was yesterday? Am I growing in my faith? Are you being lowered constantly in your own estimation of yourself? Are you constantly thinking of yourself less than you were thinking of yourself before? If you're constantly thinking of yourself as getting better, oh, look, I'm a better Christian, I'm better this, I'm better that, then you're probably going the wrong way in the strength of your faith. Your faith is as strong as your humility. Because true faith in God, the God of all the universe, who created us in His image and declares to us constantly that we have a high, high standard, not just the one that we want to set for ourselves so we can feel good about ourselves, but a high, holy, righteous standard that none of us measure up to. True faith in Him as it grows, as we know more about Him, as we believe what we learn about God, it makes us realize our own insignificance, our own lowliness, our own un worthiness, our own sin. That's a wonderful thing, knowing that God is a loving God who's died for our sins, who's given, given His Son to die for our sins, who's come and sacrificed and given us salvation, that He is, that, that letting go of yourself and your own self-righteousness is a very comforting thing, because deep down, you knew that you weren't righteous. You were just trying to convince yourself that you were because you didn't like the alternative. Well, that, now the alternative is Jesus. So it's not that bad. <laughs> you know, it's not that bad. Just, just admit it. This is something that we are constantly struggling with. It's not just something for the unbeliever. A person who calls themselves a Christian, who's coming to church on a, day, on, on a weekly basis or whatever, but they think of themselves as good, even they think coming to church gives them some sort of credibility, some sort of extra credit with God, as if, as if doing something that's, that God has commanded us to do is somehow, you know, gives you extra favor uh, with him. You've done something extra. But, you know, the person who believes themselves to be a Christian but doesn't see themselves as a sinner, has never come to the place of repentance, this helps to point, to, point them to true repentance. True faith in the gospel brings you to repentance. If you don't have repentance, it's not because you need to go work out repentance. It's because you need real faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. But this isn't just a sermon for those who are unbelievers, is it? Because those of us who are believers, who have true faith in the gospel, who have repented and recognized their own sinful condition and come to Christ for salvation, we still struggle with pride every day. And the more we struggle with pride... Um, the more we realize just how sinful we are, or we should, the more we grow in our faith, the more disgusted we should be with ourselves. The more we should be constantly throwing ourselves before the Lord and begging Him to just not be annoyed with us. <laughs> to not, to not, not let us be an annoyance to Him. You know, we're unworthy. Of course, God never speaks of us as an annoyance to Him. 
uh, or at least not those who are faithful. He's angry with the wicked every day, but those who run to him in faith. But we should see ourselves from that lowly position of humility coming before the Lord. <laughs> Verse 10 is sort of added as a side note. Like you should already know this, but just in case, just in case somebody gets the wrong idea. And they that were sent returning to the house found the servant who, whole that had been sick. Just so you know, of course, when they got back there, he was healed. Jesus did turn around, didn't go to the man's house. As far as we know, he never met the man in person. Uh, he certainly met him uh, n- now, since then. He's, uh, I- I'm confident, in heaven today. In fact, in the book of Matthew, it says that many, like this man, uh, who are not from Israel, will be in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, Jesus makes the statement, this man is a believer. He is saved. He's on his way to heaven. Like so many others who are Gentiles who will become believers, even though so many Jewish people will reject Christ and remain in unbelief because they can't get past this idea that they are sinners. And so today, of course, the man has met Jesus face to face. He's with him in heaven. But In the time of Christ, during the ministry of Christ, as far as we know, he never spoke to Jesus face to face. He came, in a sense, by sending sending the Jews and then sending his friends, but was considered himself to be completely unworthy to even come into the presence of Jesus Christ. And it was that recognition of his unworthiness that showed his faith and demonstrated that he was a true believer. Let's pray. Father in heaven. We call ourselves believers. It's one of the terms we use in exchange for the word Christian. But I wonder often about my own life, and I wonder if it's really Christian, Christ-like, or if it's really expressing faith, belief. Because I recognize that so often my life is filled with my own ideas of perfection, my own estimation of myself. My opinions are the ones everyone needs to go with because I'm right. I'm so ashamed, Lord, as I see my pride welling up in me. I see my own lack of faith. I pray that You would Increase our faith. I pray that everyone here in our church would grow to a lower position in their own eyes, would replace all of the pedestals in their hearts, they would take their place, take their own selves out of off of those pedestals and put you in all of those places. But the high, exalted positions in our hearts would be reserved only for you. And the lowliest of estimations would be left only for ourselves. Fill us with true faith and true humility, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name.